Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and number the people, that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my lord the king still see it. But why does the lord the king delight in this thing? But the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. They crossed the Jordan and began from Eroer, and from the city that is in the middle of the valley, toward Gad and on to Jezer. Then they came to Gilead and to Kadesh in the land of the Hittites. And they came to Dan, and from Dan they went around to Sidon, and came to the fortress of Tyre, and to all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites. And they went out to the Negeb of Judah at Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to the king. In Israel there were 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded. And when Arana looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Arana went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And Arana said, why has the Lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you, in order to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Arana said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering, and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Arana gives to the king. And Arana said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. But the king said to Arana, No, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Well, friends, let me encourage you to uh, keep your bulletins open to that reading there from 2 Samuel 24, or there are Bibles in the pews. Let me invite you to open up to one of those. Uh, 2 Samuel 24 is where we're going to be today. Uh, A few years ago, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, hike across a portion uh, of the presidential range uh, in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, we uh, started up going up Mount Washington and kind of made our way across some of the, the different presidential peaks. Uh, if you've never done it, it's a, it's a beautiful hike. It's a, it's a beautiful place. Uh, went with a couple of uh, brothers in the Lord here from Christ Church who have now uh, subsequently moved out of the city. Uh, but we had a great time together, a uh, great hike, uh, great fellowship, uh, beautiful scenery, 
uh, some difficult terrain along the way. It's not, a, it's not an easy hike at certain points. And uh, we were driving back uh, from this hike and um, we stopped for lunch uh, on our way back into the city. And as we were eating lunch, we had a, an opportunity to reflect on the last couple of days and uh, remember all the great experiences that we had and some of the, the difficult things that we uh, went through. And even as we were reflecting back, almost in that same sort of moment, we began looking to the future. And we began sort of scheming and thinking about other hikes uh, that we'd all like to go and, and take together. We've never done any of those since, but uh, we, we still were kind of thinking about that future. And I think that's a, a sign of a good trip, that you can, you can look back and you can give thanks and you can look forward to the future and get excited for more to come. And friends, I hope that, that some of that gratitude and some of that excitement has been your experience with First and Second Samuel. Uh, because we have been on a journey uh, through these books. Uh, it's been a long journey. It's been a multiple year journey, sort of off and on, working through these two books, which means probably a lot of you haven't been here for the whole of that journey. Uh, but I think the majority of you have been here at least for the, the last four months, this last portion of this journey that we've been on. And, and truth be told, there's been some difficult terrain to cover. Uh, these aren't the easiest books uh, in the Bible to work through. Uh, but I also hope that as we've been going along, you've seen some of the beautiful mountain peaks that have, have shown you that this is a journey uh, really worth taking. And so we are coming to the end of our journey here today. And again, we are going to encounter some difficult terrain uh, that we need to cross uh, in today's passage. So we are at the end of 2 Samuel. It's chapter 24. It's the very last chapter. And like I did at the end of my hike of the presidential range, well, we're going to look back this morning and we're going to remember some of the key themes that we've seen in First and Second Samuel. And we're also going to look to the future and what it is that's beyond this chapter in the Bible. Because that's what this chapter, I think, in large part is intended to do. You've got to remember that these final chapters, chapters 21 to 24, these, these aren't in chronological order, right? meaning that they're not placed here because this is simply what happened next in the story. Rather, they're placed here for a strategic teaching reason. And the strategy behind having chapter 24 as the closing chapter is that it's driving home to us some of, the, some of the big peaks and some of the major themes that we've encountered throughout our study, and it's doing so in such a way that it's saying to us, hey, make sure you don't forget these things as you leave. Uh, these are things that you must remember as you finish this up. And yet, at the very same time, this chapter is also pointing us to the future. In fact, I would say it's almost shouting at us that there's, there's more to come. Uh, this isn't the end of the story. Okay, so that's what we're going to do this morning. As this chapter leads us, we're going to look back, we're going to remember key themes we've seen throughout our journey, and then we're going to look forward and consider the future that it points us to. So let's pray to the Lord. Uh, let's ask him for his help this morning. Uh, gracious Father, we come to you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a God who speaks. We thank you that you have given us your word that is entirely truthful. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would give us faith to receive it this morning. Pray that you would give us humility to sit under it and not to stand over it. Lord, give us, give us that kind of humility and faith that our lives would be transformed and that we would see the glory of Jesus today. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Well, as we begin this morning by reflecting back on the journey we've been on, let me give you four themes that have been prominent in our study of First and Second Samuel and that this chapter is trying to really drive home to us here at the end. Uh, one thing we've seen that this chapter doesn't want us to miss is the fact that David is a sinner, but a sinner who consistently repents of his sin and relies on God's grace, which of course is something that we've seen prominently throughout our study of this book. Uh, when David was first introduced to us in 1 Samuel 16, he was introduced to us as someone who had a heart for God. Uh, remember, outwardly, he didn't necessarily look like he was a, a, a great king. Uh, he didn't look like he would be someone who could lead in that way. But then uh, what you find is, you, is that God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks on the heart. And David was his chosen man. Uh, but as you read from there, you, you begin a bit puzzled because David is clearly a sinful man. In fact, it's David's sin with Bathsheba and Uriah that dominates almost the entirety of the second half of 2 Samuel. And what's interesting is that the Bible never tries to cover that up. It never tries to cover that up. It, it, it doesn't, doesn't try to pretend like it's not there. 
And in fact, one of the things that connects chapter 23 with our chapter here today is David's sin. Uh, The very last verse of chapter 23 reminds us about Uriah the Hittite, the man whom David had murdered. And so it's almost like this book just keeps saying to us, don't forget that David is a sinner. Don't forget that he's a sinner saved by the grace of God. Because David is a sinner who consistently repents of his sin. Uh, That was his humble response back in 2 Samuel chapter 12. God sent Nathan the prophet to go and to confront David about what he'd done to Bathsheba and Uriah. And David's response was one of humble confession and repentance as he cast himself upon the grace and mercy of God. And we see a very similar pattern here today in chapter 24 as well. Uh, The major incident that drives the events of this chapter is the census that takes place. Uh, In verse 2, David instructs Joab to go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and number the people that I may know the number of the people. Uh, Joab immediately sees that this is a a foolish thing to do, that that something's not right with this command. And so he says to David in verse 3, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times, as many as they are, while the eyes of my Lord the King still see. So even before you die, let's pray that God will will add uh, multiple people to your kingdom. But why does my Lord the King delight in this thing? And then I think it's telling that David doesn't really have any response to that. But he's the king. And so his word wins out, and this Joab and his team, they take a nine-month journey that comprehensively covers the whole of Israel, numbering all of the men who are, quote, able to draw the sword, uh, that is able to fight in battle. Uh, That summary is given to us in verses 8 and 9. And then immediately, though, in verse 10, we're told that David was convicted that what he'd done was sinful. Uh, This census that David demanded was a sinful census. Now, maybe your response is, why? <laughs> right? Why was that a sin? I mean, surely counting people in and of itself isn't a sin. Right? I mean, we've got, we have a, a book in the Bible called Numbers. There's a, there's a lot of counting that goes on in the book of Numbers, and it's not sinful in the book of Numbers to count the people. So, so why is what David does here sinful? I think my answer to that is, I don't know. I mean, the Bible doesn't actually say why it was sinful. So a lot of people have speculated about some of the the sinful motivations that that David had for taking this census. It may be, in fact, that we're given a a little bit of a hint there with Joab's response to David in verse 3 when he basically reminds David that God is the one who's responsible for the numbers. Uh, Perhaps meaning, uh, David, don't do this in such a way that you're going to take credit for being the king of such a, a large nation. So maybe Joab there was trying to warn David about the kind of sinful pride that can be connected to this kind of counting. Or maybe it's true that David wanted to know how many men were able to draw the sword because he wanted to have his army prepared for battle. And so he wanted to make sure he had all the men in place. And thus it may be that him taking this census is a sign that he's relying more on his army than he is on God. And, And thus forgetting his own theology that he so clearly stated when he went out to battle Goliath. You know, all the way back in 1 Samuel 17, just before he struck down the giant Goliath, David rightly declared, the Lord saves not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's. Which is always a good reminder for us, I think. You know, what do we boast in? What do we delight in? What do we rely on? What are we counting to save us? Uh, It's all too easy to become enamored with outward physical success or to rely on human means of security instead of looking to the Lord and relying on the Lord and and boasting in the Lord. Remember how clear this was just two chapters back. David said, the Lord is my rock and my refuge and my stronghold. Uh, Friend, maybe that's a good thing to remind yourself of every morning before you get out of bed. Like the Lord is my salvation. Not my job, not my family, not my accomplishments. The Lord, he is my salvation. So it may have been that David had a moment, like we all do, when he simply forgot his own good theology. But the truth is we don't actually know with any certainty what David's motivations were here because we're just not told. All we know for sure is that this census was a sin. 
And so once again, the the point is driven home to us that David is a sinful man. Uh, Yes, he may be a man ultimately after God's own heart, but his heart doesn't always obey God. Uh, David is a sinner. But he's a sinner, again, who consistently repents of his sin and relies on the grace of God for forgiveness. Look at how this is described for us uh, in verse 10. But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. So he confesses his sin. He he calls it for what it is. It's sin. It's it's foolishness. Uh, Foolishness here, it doesn't mean foolish in the sense of simply being dumb, but uh, in the sense of being perverted. Right? It's, a, it's a perversion of righteousness. And so he confesses it, he turns from it, and in doing so he turns to the only one who can do something about it, and that's God. He casts himself upon the grace and mercy of God. And he does so, in fact, even when faced with the consequences of his sin. Even after confession and repentance, that doesn't mean there aren't any consequences. There are clear consequences here for David's sinful census. This is what we see in verses 11 to 14. God sends the prophet Gad, and he gives David three consequences to choose from. Three years of famine, three months of being attacked by his enemies, or three days of a plague spreading throughout the land. And then look at David's response in verse 14. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. Now, in saying that, he's essentially rejecting option number two. He doesn't want to fall into the hands of his enemies like the Philistines. And so then he's really just leaving with the Lord to send either a famine or a plague. But the more significant part of his response is the fact that he'd rather fall into the hands of the Lord then fall into the hands of, 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 of other men. Which, which may surprise some of us to hear David say that. I mean, after all, God is far more dangerous than any enemy. God is far bigger than any Philistine. He's far stronger than any Philistine. Uh, the Bible's clear about that. It is a, is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But you see, what David also knows is that God is more merciful and more just than any Philistine out there. And so by faith, David casts himself upon the mercy of God. And so friends, as we come to the end of First and Second Samuel, there's, there's much we should learn from the life of David. You know, it's been said of David that he doesn't always obey God, but he always deals with God. And so this chapter is placed here at the end of this book in part to remind us that David is a sinner but that he's a sinner who consistently repents of his sin. He relies on the grace of God alone for his, for his forgiveness. Uh, friends, you will sin. Uh, you have sinned. The question is, what do you do when you sin? Uh, you should turn to the Lord. Uh, don't run from God when you sin. Run to him and cast yourself upon his mercy. Second, And just briefly on this one. A second prominent theme here in this chapter, which helps us to reflect back over our whole study, uh, is the twin theme of God's wrath and his mercy. Notice that verse 1 begins on the note of God's anger. And and it's telling that the word again is there. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Israel. Uh, We're not told exactly uh, what Israel's sin was in this case, but we've seen the righteous anger of God prominently throughout this book. Uh, Whether it was God's anger and judgment against the horrible sin of Eli's sons, uh, or God's wrath against Saul's sinful pride, uh, or his wrath against those who uh, presumptuously misused the Ark of the Covenant, or, or against David and David's house because of David's sin. First and Second Samuel have made it abundantly clear that God is utterly opposed to sin. Sin kindles his anger, and it brings his judgment. 
So verse 1 tells us that again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And verse 15 then tells us about his judgment against Israel through a devastating pestilence that wiped out 70,000 men. And yet, as we've also seen repeatedly throughout this book, in the midst of God's fierce, righteous anger and judgment is undeserved mercy. Uh, Even with this pestilence, God is merciful. Uh, He doesn't exercise the fullness of his judgment here. David banked on the mercy of God in verse 14, and that proved absolutely right. Uh, Look at how this plays out in verses 15 and 16. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, it is enough, now stay your hand. So he brings his judgment to a halt. He doesn't exercise the fullness of it upon Jerusalem. Uh, I've quoted Dale Ralph Davis's commentary uh, many times uh, in this series. Let me quote it one last time. Uh, Davis describes the tone of this chapter as being, quote, wrath wrapped in mercy. Wrath wrapped in mercy. And I think that's a good way to describe it. Now, the character of God is such that his, his wrath is very often wrapped in mercy. He doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. He doesn't always give us what our sins deserve. Third, God is sovereign over everything. That's another prominent theme that we've seen throughout First and Second Samuel in which this closing chapter is calling us to reflect on in order to drive it home in our lives. It is the the massive mountain peak of the theme that God is sovereign over everything. Uh, We've just clearly seen in this chapter how David sinned, how David was responsible for his own sin, of the consequences that would come from God because of David's sin, Right? All of that's very clearly stated here in this chapter. But what verse 1 of this chapter reveals is that God is behind it all. That everything that takes place in this chapter happens according to the sovereign will of God as he works to accomplish his plans and purposes in this world. Look at verse 1. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he, God, incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. So the king, David, said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Bathsheba and number the people that I may know the number of of the people. So why did David go and number the people? Because God incited him to do it. God spoke his will to David in such a way that he told David to go and number them, and in doing so, David was stirred up to go and do just that. Now, if that causes you some consternation, I mean, how could God incite David to do something which is ultimately sinful and for which God then punishes David for doing it? Right? How is that possible? Well, let me make things more difficult and point out to you that in the parallel account of this event in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, that it's actually Satan who's identified as the one who incited David to go and number the people. This is 1 Chronicles 21, verse 1. Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So now it seems we have a real conundrum, don't we? I mean, who exactly is the one acting here? Who exactly is responsible for the taking of the census? Is it David? Is it Satan 
Is it God? And the answer is yes. All right, yes, in a certain way, David is responsible for this. And yes, in a certain way, Satan is responsible for this. And yes, in a certain way, God is responsible for this. I mean, let's just make sure we're looking very closely at what the text says here. That's, that's our concern. We're interested in what the Bible says. What does the Bible say here? Well, 2 Samuel 24, verse 1 is very clear that God's anger against Israel has been stirred up because of their sin. And now God is going to use David's sinful census as his instrument to carry out his judgment against Israel through the very punishment that he gives to David for David's action, which God incited. Now, whether we can fully grasp and understand how, how all of that can work together, again, let's just see that that's very clearly what's being said here. And then, then the parallel account in 1 Chronicles 21 further reveals that the way God incited David to take this action so that he could judge Israel's sin was through permitting Satan to stir David up so that David, of his own free will, we would say, would, would make the choice to number the people. Okay, so Satan merely thought he was causing God's anointed king to fall into sin, but behind it all was God accomplishing his sovereign will in order to carry out his plans and his purposes for his kingdom. Uh, David was acting of his own free will, Satan was acting of his own free will, but behind it all was the sovereign will of the living God. Uh, that's what you get when you put these two texts together. The Lord used Satan as his agent in inciting David to be the agent of his anger against Israel. Now these are some, some very deep theological waters uh, we've entered into here this morning. So uh, don't expect to, to fully grasp this. I don't. I'm not sure anybody does fully. Uh, there's, a, there's a good deal of mystery here. But let's just make sure we have some, some clear ground rules in place, okay? First, God is not the author of sin. Uh, James chapter 1 is explicit about this. God is so good that he, he can't even tempt people to sin. And so when we, when we talk about the sovereign will of God being behind something like this, we need to be clear that, that God is not behind sin and Satan in the same way that he's behind that which is good. God is not the author of sin. Second, God is indeed sovereign over everything. And friends, by everything, I mean everything. That big things, small things, significant things, insignificant things. Pleasant experiences, unpleasant experiences. God is sovereign over it all. He's sovereign over human hearts. He turns them as he wills. He's sovereign over the hair of your head. Not a hair from your head will fall apart from his will. God is sovereign over everything. Everything happens according to his will. Third, our decisions are real decisions for which we are fully responsible. So is God completely sovereign? Yes, 100% so. Are the choices we make real choices for which we are completely responsible? Yes, 100% so. I think perhaps one helpful way to try and kind of sort through all of this is to, to simply look at the cross of Jesus. You know, and to ask the question, what led to Jesus' crucifixion? Like, who's responsible for Jesus' death? Right, was Judas responsible for it? I mean, he betrayed Jesus. He handed him over. Uh, were the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders, were, were they responsible for it? I mean, they definitely wanted Jesus out of the way. They turned him over to the Romans. Or were the Romans responsible for it? You know, they, they didn't want an insurrection to be, to be arising there. But they literally crucified him. Were they responsible? Or how, how about Satan? Was Satan responsible for it? We're, we're told explicitly that Satan entered into Judas's heart and he was at work in Judas in that decision. 
And friends, the answer to all those questions is yes. They're all responsible. Judas is responsible. The religious leaders were responsible. The Romans were responsible. Satan was responsible. But you see, even behind all of that is God. Listen to what the Apostle Peter says in Acts chapter 2. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So you did it, he says. You are responsible. But you did it by handing him over to the Romans who did it. They're responsible. They crucified him. But behind it all is God. All of this took place according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. It was God's plan. Uh, it was God's sovereign plan to have Jesus crucified for our sins. It all happened according to the will of God. Okay, so all three of those principles are vital to hold on to. God is not the author of sin. God is sovereign over everything. And we are entirely responsible for our own actions. Now, maybe none of that helps you get out of the deep waters we're in with this. Uh, but hopefully it at least helps you stay afloat in these waters. Perhaps even one day it'll help you to learn to swim joyfully and freely in these waters. Because friends, it seems that the author of First and Second Samuel has placed this account here at the very end of his book and he's described it in the way that he has because it's a reminder that driving all of the events of these books from, from the barrenness and then the fruitfulness of Hannah's womb uh, to the rise and fall of Saul, to the, to the victories over enemies, to the, to the choice of David as king, all of it from beginning to end is under God's sovereign control. And that's what this book is about. It's about God. It's about God carrying out his plans and his purposes to establish his eternal kingdom with his eternal king on the throne forever. Now you can run from that. And you can balk at the idea of a completely sovereign God. Or you can do what the Bible does. And you can rest and rejoice in the fact that a good God is in complete control. Fourth, a fourth significant theme that this closing chapter is reminding us of and driving home to us is the theme of atonement. In other words, it's the good news that we encountered just a few chapters back that God's judgment against sin can be satisfied through a substitute sacrifice. Uh, this is what we see emphasized in verses 15 to 25. Uh, it's noteworthy that at the end of verse 16, we're given this little detail about where the angel of destruction was when he ceased carrying out God's wrath and instead showed mercy. Uh, look again at, at verse 16. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, it is enough, now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. Okay, so that's the place where God's judgment ends and his, his mercy becomes prominent. Now, if you look at verse 17, uh, verse 17 is telling us what David was doing when all of this judgment was taking place in verse 15. So here's how all of this went down from David's perspective. Verse 17. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. Now, that's a high moment for David there. Uh, that's, a, that's a true king right there. He's, he's interceding on behalf of his people, the, the, the sheep, the helpless sheep of his kingdom. And he's wanting to take the punishment and the, and the judgment and the pain himself so that the people will be spared. And God's answer to that, that plea of his, which leads to the cessation of his judgment against Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
is to send David to the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite, so that David can purchase it and turn it into an altar on which he then can offer sacrifices which will satisfy God's judgment and atone for the sins of the people. Verse 21, And Aruna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the people. Uh, Same with verse 25. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. Okay, so put all this together. Uh, God's carrying out his judgment against sin. While it's happening, David is interceding and he's pleading for the people by offering his life in place of theirs. But the way that God responds to David's pleas, not by putting David to death, but by sending David to go and build an altar where other sacrifices can be made in place of David, and David does that, and God brings an end to his judgment. That's where the angel of destruction brings that destruction to an end. It's at the threshing floor of Aruna. And friends, we've seen this before, haven't we? Uh, This provision of substitute sacrifices. After David's sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, God spared David by by instead putting to death the son of David. Uh, We also saw it very prominently in chapter 21 where Saul's grandsons were hanged on a piece of wood on a hill so that Saul's sin could be atoned for and thus the people could live. And here it is again to, to close out this whole book. God providing the way for substitute sacrifices to be made to atone for the sin of human beings so they can receive his mercy instead of his judgment. It's the theme of atonement. Friends, you see what a rich chapter this is. So many themes for us to look back on. Uh, The truth about David's sin and repentance. Uh, The twin realities of God's wrath and mercy. The affirmation of the sovereignty of God. And then here now, once again, the good news that God's judgment against human sin can be satisfied through the intercession of a substitute sacrifice. And you see, it's that in particular which is almost shouting at us to not just look back and reflect on the themes of Samuel, but to also look forward And to consider the glorious things that the the end of this book looks forward to. You know, the feel that this chapter gives you, in in a sense, there at the end, is is almost right there at the end of verse 25. You you could write in there, to be continued. Because this isn't the end of the story. In fact, in some ways, it's just the beginning. It's, It's just the foundation, almost literally, being laid. This this is God sovereignly working out his plans for a glorious future for his people. So look forward. Look forward. Do you see it? And this is a Christian church, so we better see some of it, right? Look forward. Uh, From the vantage point of 2 Samuel 24, look forward and see, first of all, a temple being built, a beautiful temple that would one day become the central place of worship for God's people in the Old Testament. Because understand, that's where this is. <laughs> this, this threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite, which David purchases, and on which he builds an altar to offer sacrifices to deal with the sins of the people. This is the very place on which David's son Solomon would build the temple. It's right there. And so this very location became the place where God's people would come to meet with God and to have their sins atoned for. And it's where God's house and the worship of God would begin to be put in order. Uh, First Samuel began actually with God's house in disarray and the worship of God defiled due to disobedient priests. But here now, at the end, we're we're being pointed to the worship of God being restored through the building of a temple by David's son Solomon on this very spot that David just purchased and made atonement for the sins of the people. Which, by the way, is also the very same spot where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, his son, but was instead given a substitute sacrifice. Same place, Mount Moriah. Okay, so look forward. See a temple being built. See sin being atoned for through sacrifices. 
see God being rightly worshipped. And then as you look forward, though, don't just stop with that temple built by Solomon, but look even further down the line and see David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the, the true king, the one whose throne will never come to an end because unlike his ancestor David, Jesus is not a sinner who needs to be forgiven of anything. And thus, unlike David, he could legitimately offer himself in the place of sinners to take the punishment they deserved. He could legitimately say, not them, but me. I'm the good shepherd. Let me lay down my life for the sheep. And so he would be our substitute sacrifice, dying in the place of sinners, receiving the judgment they deserve so that everyone who puts their faith in him can be forgiven of their sin. And friends, his sacrifice was so perfect, his sacrifice was so comprehensive, so final, so sufficient, that no other sacrifices would ever be needed to atone for sin. Jesus was the final sacrifice. And therefore, he himself became the very temple in which we go to meet God. We no longer need any physical building because we no longer need any physical sacrifice of an animal or anything else. You know, the place we go to meet God is the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, the author of Hebrews declares in Hebrews chapter 13 that as Christians, we have an altar. But that altar isn't the altar of some old temple. That altar is the very cross of Christ. That's where we go to meet with God and to worship him and have our sins dealt with through Jesus as our sacrifice. Friends, do you see it? Do you see where 2 Samuel 24 ultimately leads us? At all of these themes that we've seen throughout now wrapped up here, sin, wrath, judgment, grace, mercy, intercession, atonement, substitute sacrifices, a temple for worship, all of it right here. It's the gospel according to Samuel. And so as we come to the end of this journey, uh, though we have indeed crossed some difficult terrain, uh, make sure you don't just look back. Make sure you also look forward to the majestic views that are laid out before you. It's the sovereign plan and purpose of God being worked out in every detail, leading us all the way to the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your wisdom. And we thank you that you are the sovereign God, that you know all things. You know the beginning from the end. Uh, Lord, would you give us faith to trust you? Even when we have questions, Lord, help us to trust you, to trust your word. Lord, thank you for the beauty and the majesty of the gospel. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is the good shepherd and that he has laid down his life for us, the sheep. Lord, would you help us to hear his voice, to respond to him, to trust him, and to follow him. And we ask this in his name. Amen.